Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Nature Journal Educators Forum. Um, this is where we collectively try to figure out best practices in, um, in sharing. I like seeing that kitty cat walking around uh, on Avea's screen. Um, uh, best practices in nature journaling. And today we want to take a really um, careful and thoughtful look at working with, with elders in our community. And um, what, if you are sort of, if you're a content provider, what are going to be some things that are particularly, going to be particularly useful to, to keep in mind as we develop our programs. And um, we also want to think about, you know, what are, what are things that just sort of may not be on our radar? Um, and, and lastly, what do we, um, you know, are there any kind of important unmet needs? Oh, try that again, unmet <laughs> needs. There we go, I did my little spoonerism. Um, any unmet needs um, out there that we should collectively be thinking about in providing um, um, access and, 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 and useful content to, to elders and to everybody. Let's just get started by um, giving everybody to a chance to kind of grab a little piece of paper and what I'm going to suggest you do is to, um, we're just going to do a, about a minute and a half of brain dump onto paper. So the topic is, um, is working with elders, nature journaling programs um, for elders. Um, what are things that we want to be thinking about? Um, or are there any, you know, uh, particular barriers or opportunities with um, working with elders. Let's just take a little bit of free write uh, right now and bonus points if you put in some icons. Well, um, let's, why don't we begin? Um, what, what, what we're going to do is we're going to, um, we're going to be having a, an, an open and probably free ranging conversation about best practices with working with elders, um, thoughts, challenges, ideas. I'm going to start off by um, bringing in Sandra into the conversation and people should be able to unmute themselves. And um, Sandra, yes. it's I'm, really good I'm to here. see you. Thank you. I, I think number one on my list, since I am an elder, is uh, mobility issues. Yes. Um, so can you um, paint a picture for us of things that you have noticed or things that you have observed um, where um, there are opportunities that were just inaccessible because those mobility sorts of mobility issues weren't really thought through? Um, well, I, I don't have much experience with nature journaling since I'm rather new to this whole thing. So I don't, I don't have anything to say about that except that I cannot access things easily even in my own yard. Mm -hmm. I, I need to have um, somebody with me. And, you know, that doesn't make me very comfortable. And I, you know, I don't try very hard to, to have that happen. So I'm on my own. That, so if, if we're not really thinking those things through, um, just what, what seems like a, you know, just, if you're just like, you know, everybody go out into the, your garden right now and get a leaf that alone um, can be a, a, a barrier right there, that we have assumptions about how easy it is just to, to run around and 
be able to um, both in terms of transportation to get to a place. And then yeah. once you are at that place, moving around in that space, um, people who are more mobile will have lots of assumptions about like, oh, that's, that's not a problem. Um, and those are major obstacles. One thing that, that helps is um, to not rely on spontaneity, just to be able to say, you know, next, uh, next time we meet, it would be good if you had a couple of different leaves from uh, around your garden or your neighborhood. That gives us a way to prepare. So, you know, sp spontaneity is a little more troublesome, but, um, you know, we, we, are, we are still willing. That, that's, that's a really good thought. So that is, so a way of, um, you know, there, there are ways around some of these challenges if we know that they are coming down the pipe and, and we can take actions now to prepare ourselves for those. But just sort of in the, the heat of the moment, um, we saying like everybody run out and grab three leaves. Uh, they should be different kinds, ideally one with serrated edges. <laughs> You're stuck, right? Yeah. That's, that's a really, really useful thought. And, and also what I, I appreciate, we've got, um, and we won't be able to do this on, on, on all our thoughts here, but we, so we've, we've seen a challenge and also we're already thinking about ways to kind of navigate some of those challenges. So advance notice planning um, is going to be much more important than you would be thinking about with, with other audiences. Thank you yep. very much. You're welcome. Um, let's see here. Um, what's a, another thought or idea that um, occurred to somebody? Or um, let's jump over to Billy Joe. Good to see you again. Hi. Um, I was thinking, um, kind of going along with Sandra's in terms of the mobility, but I was thinking more with their hands, right? So if there was arthritis or um, things like that as they get older, the holding of a pencil or, you know, things like that might be a little bit um, uh, painful sometimes or a little bit of a struggle. So I'm wondering, you know, I was trying to think of, of thoughts that, you know, would painting maybe uh, be a bit better because it was a little bit more flowy and not the same same sort of way that you're holding your um, your pencil that might be something or you know sketching lightly where they weren't so focused so is there a different way that they could do that the other thing I was thinking was time right is to give lots of time for it to happen to give breaks to sort of let them let their hands kind of relax and things like that so the hand mobility was one thing I was sort of thinking about especially with all the writing and the drawing and the sketching yeah, so that kind of tight pencil grip. Yeah, or just, just the long amount of it. Like many of us are keyboard people now, right? So I, I find even at 40, it, writing a long period of time, my hand gets sore, right? Because I'm used to click, 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 clicking in a different way. Um, so, you know, if you have now, you've added arthritis to that and sometimes the knuckles get bigger, you know, different things like that. I wonder if that would be a little bit more. And so then, you know, with that stuff can come emotion as well, right? So Sandra had mentioned like, you know, going outside on her own was, there was a bit of fear in that and that she would need somebody else to be there, right? So I think with that, sometimes fears come or confidence issues, right? So I think just really being prepared with alternatives um, to make them, you know, make everyone as comfortable as possible so that everyone can enjoy it. But saying like, yeah, if you have arthritis, like maybe this would be a different way of doing it. Or, you know, if you needed a seat outside for the mobility, like, could you get a chair to sit out there and could you do it from that? So different ways of kind of pre-thinking that stuff, like, you know, Sandra had mentioned as well, like, you know, next week we're going to be doing the garden. So are you able to find a suitable chair that would put you close to the garden so that you could be sort of journaling outside? Like what are some of the, the ways that we can kind of think that through? So anyways, just a thought. So uh, that's neat. You're really thinking about um, alternatives and um, that 
and and to to deliberately, as Sandra was saying, plan those in advance. Um, the we've got the idea of um, also al alternatives for for the activity, alternatives for materials that you would use. Um, perhaps work with um, work with the people to to sort of find out what are what are media that are more effective that we can use in the field. Yeah, I was just thinking like don't... charcoal and stuff too, right? Like you could smudge with your, I was just thinking about that. Like you could use charcoal or pastels that you would be able to sort of use like with your fingertips to smudge in and around um, that you're not holding onto something. So that maybe that could be something like, I'm just kind of spitballing ideas. So yeah. I mean, interesting, interesting sort of things to think about. It'd be, yeah, these are things which we want to, um, and and so we, we may be kind of come, um, hatching some new ideas in this, and then it's going to be up for all of us to go out there and actually test these and see how it works. And I want to encourage people with, with both with practical experience doing these things to come back to us um, and, or, or to, to let us know what you've figured out already. But also, if any of these ideas seem possible and plausible to you, to test those and then to circle back to this group and share that information. Um, I like that thought. Uh, let's see here. Um, what what more can we say? Um, Aisha, um, I'm going to bring you in here. Um, hi there. Oh, you're currently muted. Now, now working? Now, loud and clear. Okay, sorry about the dark shadows. What I was going to add is I have been learning from my elder friends, the best place to learn, is um, I, I'm thinking like as we go back in person too, that I have to suss out my sights beforehand very, very carefully and resus because what I think is flat when I take them out is not flat. Um, so I'm learning to look at places with a different eye as I just prepare, not even the nature journey experience, like where I might want to take anybody who loves nature and is losing access, including perhaps myself, anything could happen. Um, so where are the spots that are beautiful, but gosh, there's no short little scramble down or anything. Um, there's a place yeah. to rest your back with a log or, you know, just just bringing that awareness as you're looking at sites always is something I've started adding in. Yeah, that, that little water bar in the trail um, to divert runoff, you know, can be the thing that stops the scooter. Um, yeah, so, so looking at your sites and, um, and I, th I think you actually, you, you're, you, made, you made a really important point here of not trusting your memory of the site. Yeah, when I went out there, it seemed pretty good. That was fine. Right? Um, when, I, when I got um, uh, married, we had this uh, great thought of um, word. Uh, there's this uh, there's a, there's a bluff on on Mount Tamalpais, and we'll just get a chair and wheel my mom out there, and um, what could possibly go wrong? And then doing uh, it was exactly what you're talking about, Aisha. That that you know we went we checked out that site. Yeah, it seemed pretty good. Yeah, it's not going to be a problem. You couldn't get out of the parking lot. <laughs> and um, unfortunately, we did. This, this was discovered before the day. And and then, and, but we were out there with with one of my friends, and we brought a wheelchair out there, and we were trying to push it down that trail. And first of all, it would have been dangerous, and it also would have been difficult for her dignity. Um, yeah. You know, having this crew of people around her just kind of like, ah, 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 
uh, uh, you know, and we have the, you know, came up with these other things like, like, we'll just like come up with this thing where like, they will get a couple of posts and put that into a chair and then people can pick that up and, and carry her. And, but then the more of a, a hua blah that there is around getting mom from point A to point B, um, it's shining a real spotlight on, you know, like, oh, look, my mom's having difficulty getting out here. And, and uh, you know, aren't we all great put pitching in to just to, to bring her out here. Um, and, but she doesn't want to be in that spotlight. Wow, that's yep. a great point, the spotlight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so how can you get from here to there and maintain the dignity, the personal space of, of, of participants? So sort of tying into what Sandra was saying with mobility, it's, it's, it takes intention. It really takes intention, doesn't it? Yeah. Sandra. Oh, you are currently muted. Now you're good. Okay, okay. sorry. Um, one needs to consider eyesight and hearing because um, what younger people can see, even with glasses, we often cannot see. And also um, asking us to uh, write down a, a chart of a bird song, you know, forget it. Um, I'm glad I can hear you. I, I, I can't hear the darn bird. Yeah, those high pre frequency pitches are the first things to go usually. That's, that is true. Yeah. Um, I, I won't hear the cicadas when I go to bed. You know, I take my hearing aids off and it's gone. Yeah. Um, so let, let's, yeah, let's think a little bit about that, that, you know, I, you know, hold up a little visual here, like, you know, just, just do this. And um, don't assume that even if people are wearing glasses, that that means that they can see that effectively from that range. And hearing is a, a, a very challenging thing. My dad, um, his, his hearing became really, really compromised. First of all, it's exactly what you mentioned, Sandra. The bird song, the high frequency bird song was the first to go. And he was a birder. He loved listening to those birds. And then he lost the ability to hear the birds. Um, and, um, later it was really important that when I would talk to him, that I would sit in a place that he could see my face and I would turn my head to him and I would talk so that he could also watch my mouth as I was forming my words, because he was looking to that for clues about what I was saying. So partly it was coming in through the, the ears, but also being able to, um, to see the, the mouth moving. So turning your head towards, towards dad, that, that helped a lot. Don't talk to the back of my head. Right. So um, I should assume that you can't hear me when I'm doing that, right? Um, ab absolutely right. Um, and another interesting thing that I've, I've read, I don't know, uh, I haven't, um, but I have, have read, and actually this is interesting for, from two different um, reasons. One is that, that, that when you're trying to do lip reading, it's easier for us to be, it's it going to be easier for you to understand what I'm saying if we're at the same eye level. Um, but if I'm up here, um, the angles are different and it's a little bit changing, different. Another thing is that when, when I'm up above looking down on somebody. Not then, good. <laughs> yeah, there's, I mean, this is a messed up power dynamic, right? Um, and we're, hold on, try them again. Um, 
so um, elders have been through a full life and and have you know we've we've developed our brains had all these incredible experiences and then um well, there's there's a, 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 a there, there can be a tendency to infantilize elders to treat them like children to call them yep. Like my mom would go, you want to drive my, go send my mom ballistic, call her dearie, mm -hmm. right? Call her dearie. You'll only do that once. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and, and, and this is, and, and me being up here, you know, it's also, you know, in that, in that, that, that same kind of, um, uh, has that same sort of effect. Yep. So for both for ease of lip reading um, and also thinking about just the, the dynamic between you and elders that you're working with. You want to approach the community with reverence, awe, love, and respect. Cool. And I think that that, that you know, part of that is 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 being here, um, but that also ties into lots of, of of other aspects of of how we're going to interact. I'm going to bring um, Ann Chadwick in either to um, for a different thought or to extend on this. Um, Ann, really good to. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, I think kind of to follow up on that, and I was also thinking about accessibility issues in terms of if we're virtual, some people have trouble, regardless of age, but um, have trouble just navigating the technology. And then I was also thinking about um, when we're in person navigating the landscape. Um, so I just wondered, I just wanted to toss this out there for discussion is whether it might help to have like a buddy system where people who are more able or more comfortable with the technology or the landscape or even uh, putting really young, you know, students and kids with elders, um, just pairing people up a little bit and having them help each other out go through this process of discovery together. Um, there will be some strengths from each person, some weaknesses maybe. So um, just wanted to toss that out for discussion of kind of a pairing up or a buddy system. The, um, for both on, I like that idea, both from a safety perspective and also a relationship building perspective. Um, something that um, one of the, the most devastating things that we do in our culture to elders is to isolate them from, from other people. So social interaction is one of the fundamental things for people's happiness, their satisfaction with their, 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 their life. If, you, if you're um, actively interacting with other people, people with lots of hardships are much better, better able to handle that. Um, and, but in our um, culture, there's a tendency to, uh, by that I'm saying sort of, that my, the culture that I sort of see around me here in the United States, here in California, um, uh, if somebody like, oh, you, uh, you're going to have trouble um, nav physically navigating that. Well, um, then we say, well, then this, then these activities aren't for you. Then you know, and, and then you're sort of an increasingly sort of you know, distancing. Um, and at the extreme end, we're taking our elders and um, locking them away so that we can't see them. Um, and the uh, but intentionally, when there are elders in your program, looking for this as an opportunity of extending social circles and interpersonal connections, 
And I liked what you were saying, Anne, about sort of, you know, young and old. Something that has been really neat in the Nature Journal Club is that we, we have, um, uh, when we're meeting in person, there were these, we do these big intergenerational events. And so we had elders and we had youth together and, um, it was, it, it went really, really well. But I really like your idea of intentionally like buddying people together. Um, and not yeah. that like, this is the only person you're going to be um, interacting with, but but also when, um, but, but it, when you would come to, to an, a, a nature journaling event, if there's at least one new strong bond that gets made there, these sort of social bonds yeah. And it might be something really simple like um, giving somebody a ride to an event uh, or just being there to lend them a hand on a trail or take a chair for them, you know, a stool, um, carry their stuff. Uh, you know, I'm just thinking about I traveled, I was really lucky to travel with my aunt as she grew older. And I, I kind of felt like I kept her going, you know, like she knew I was gonna be there just to lend a hand or just to set up a chair or whatever it was gonna be. And so she could keep doing the stuff that she loved and pursue her curiosity. Um, and it didn't feel like I was doing much, but just little things like that. Um, and so I think there's, there's a value and there is certainly that social bond as well that could be just mm -hmm. terrific. You don't want to intrude on, um, uh, I've lost the word, uh, independence of the person. That's an interesting thought. So you've got somebody's independence and we want to connect them. So maybe the, the buddy as, as not an obligate thing, but an option there for mm -hmm. you if you... Um, if you want. Um, I see that um, there's actually several folks that um, I think want to, th this is kind of getting into an interesting area. So I'm going to bring both um, Ayoka and Aisha um, into this. And uh, let's uh, all sort of see if we can share this space here. Um, <laughs> hey, everybody. Um, and um, so, um, Ayoka, why don't you you lead us, and then let's also let let's so let's sort of ping pong these um, these these ideas a little bit more. Uh, I've been really excited about this topic, um, and that is because I come from a bit of a different angle. I have not taught nature journaling; I'm learning myself. But I um, worked for a long time as a speech therapist, and I, as you, some of you know, I work with, um, I'm a, a sketch noter, and I work with visuals as a sort of a language. So I've had a, um, an elderly patient who was in a wheelchair, she had a stroke, and we used to, she used to love to go outside, and I used to take her outside, and I noticed that um, she did not need to draw or do anything herself but I, I made like these little cards so I have like lots and lots of little cards and these are just symbols of what we experienced together some of them we saw and then other things we and we would like add the names and it would make I, I could see the light bulb going off in her head and and I was just pre-COVID I was just about to try to bring um, elders together with uh, younger people and talk about lives and I would want to draw what the topic was and now I've been thinking about how in in the older generation there's so much knowledge about plants and love and they've, they've like the older generation has grown up a lot more nature bound than the young people now and it would be a way to to get that knowledge conserved even if the old people, some of them may not be able to draw themselves or um, to write themselves anymore. But if there was like an exchange of knowledge and a shared project to get a lot of what we really need as a culture, all this love for the land um, to younger people who might not be so connected to the land. 
and that kind of ties in with the body system and it ties in with lots of things that have been said before. Um, and yeah, I really, I'm really excited to explore more of these kind of possibilities. And I wanted to bring the idea that maybe if people are not able to do nature journaling themselves, they might totally enjoy to do it together with somebody, talk about it or be included in the activity in some way that is suitable for the abilities of the person. And it might be a wonderful shared experience. Something that you're highlighting there that I, I really want to, to I'm I'm uh, I'm starting to do my sketch notes of it um, is is this um, Ayoka's bringing out to, to the this this idea that it is um, there's there's deep good just in my session what's up oh sorry I didn't. Okay. Mary Jo, um, I think you're open mic. That was an accident. <laughs> okay. um, so uh, that th th there's there's that there's this incredible opportunity that we have to encounter people who have been alive on this planet and have a deeper memory of it than 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 we have, and to. Um, that we that younger people can really benefit if we learn how to actively really listen and engage with with elders. So I think part part of what I what what I want part of what I'm I'm, I'm grabbing out of your idea um, there, Ayoka, is this thought that. Um, That, that that we it, it's not just wouldn't it be nice um, for the elders to have an opportunity to go out in nature journaling for youth and um, and for younger people in that same community in that same group we want to really be open to learning from elders and their deep time um, experience and richer perspective just from having um, bumped around on this planet more. Um, I, I like that a lot. Um, Aisha. Aisha. Oh, oh so, sorry, I, so um, I'm, I'm gonna, I, every once in a while I write, write it down and then I forget, so, but um, that's right, um, Aisha? Yes. Aisha. Two syllables. Um. So um, yeah, going back to the partnering or buddying idea, um, I just decided to share some thoughts that go back to our attempt to approach the cultural diversity aspect as well, because uh, that's what came to mind. And um, it's a lot more complicated because of that, um, because as Sandra pointed out, it can infringe on independence for some people, but I grew up in the subcontinental culture, which is India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. And I know Latino culture can be similar as well as other Asian countries and elders are treated very differently. It would be a given that every young person around would be raised to help if needed to you know, assist, um, they would be doing it they wouldn't need to be buddied up, uh, right? They just, it's a default. And the elder would be very accepting of it as opposed to offended. They would expect the help from the younger people and they wouldn't see it uh, as a infringement on their independence. So it's extremely different, different. And I watch the both sides of my family. Like I've watched my white side and my elders there, elder, grow old very differently and I had to learn how to be around them and the other side very differently so you know this is actually very complicated if you have a mixed group and you'll have very mixed expectations of what um, elders are comfortable with and what younger people uh, see is right to do I see a very hands-off culture here in the U.S. for the most part which I find difficult because I'm like, I didn't grow up with that. Like that seems rude to me, but the reverse seems rude to others. So I just wanted to 
add that diversity piece in there for um, digestion. Yeah, and so and diversity among cultures and and individuals. You know, elders yep. are not a homogeneous mass, are they? No, um, no. they're all going about it in a different way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it just kind of comes back to like, you know, how do we do the social circle idea that and building that relationship you and Anne were talking about, but have it be in a more natural way. Uh, so it's for the people who are interested about it, or it's an invitation, but, you know, nobody kind of gets stuck in a situation they don't quite want to be in, you know, and I, I don't know what the answer right. would be. Um, yeah. I've only, you know, worked with kids, so I'm just kind of curious to go, hmm. That it might feel sort of artificial, like, and this is your buddy, right? Because we need to keep an eye on you, right? Um, as opposed to, can we... Um, what would be things that we could do to sort of generate an, an ethic within the community of elders are our resource and we have the privilege to get to engage with them? Um, oh, you, know. you just talk or <laughs> I'm Diane, I'm human. Oh, yes, yes, Diane, please. Uh, I used to be an activities director in a convalescent home. And so, um, you know, that was one of the things we did was how to get them involved in different activities, including gardening. And and um, so the most we could do was get them in their wheelchairs and roll them out to the patio or. Um, and so that's how we kind of interacted with them. But the thing that came to mind was the, the lady that kind of, for lack of a better word, had flashcards. And I think that maybe that would be one of the kinds of journaling, nature journaling that could happen is having the um, elders, which I thought when you first said it was a duck, <laughs> the elder duck, anyway, was um, is their memories of things that were in their garden and have draw stick figures of tulips and daffodils and and then, you know, if you wanted to share them with other people and see if they, you know, have them put the name of them on there like they did and just bringing back their, the memories of their own gardens was um, some of the things we did. And we did chalk and watercolor and just had different artists come and, and then they just would, you know, kind of express how they felt about different pictures and that was always that was always uh, rewarding. That's a that's a really good thought. Um, yeah, just sort of, and you're you're sort of rethinking, you know, what kind of resources, what sort of tools, um, are going to be most accessible for that for that population. Um, now, uh, I, I'm going to bring in um, Rebecca and. Um, Ivea, um, the both, uh, so uh, Rebecca, you had your hand up a bit, and um, um, Ivea, you've been dropping some jewels into the chat there, but I want to get them out into the um, conversation with the, with the general population here. Um, uh, so uh, let's 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 lead with uh, Rebecca and then bounce over to Vea. Hi. So there's um, this relates to the knowledge that we can learn from elders. Um, there's this idea in conservation. I've actually talked to Jack about this before. It's called shifting baseline syndrome, and it's the idea that things in the environment are changing over time, but we don't notice it because our frame of reference keep change, it keeps changing because of just the amount of time that you know, we remember. So you know, we might point to some place that seems to us like this really pristine, you know, wild area. It's just like, this is perfect nature, but we don't realize that it's actually really degraded from how it was like 50 years ago or 100 years ago. And so that's one of the things um, we're working with elders so we they remember a long time ago and they remember what things used to be like um and you're like oh like this this species of fish used to be here or this kind of plant or this 
this mall used to be a forest or whatever it is that we don't even think about because to us it just seems normal nowadays and so that's um something that we can learn if we talk to elders um and and we also just with hearing their stories and the intergenerational activities um, for the writing workshop, I've actually been planning to have a session that's about intergenerational nature stories. Um, I don't have a date planned for that yet, but um, I'm thinking probably sometime soon. Re Rebecca, those, I'm so delighted with what you're bringing to this community with those writing workshops. Um, so for people who don't know about those, this is, um, this is Wednesdays. What time? It's at noon Eastern time, 9 a.m. Pacific time. Um, and we can learn more about that on the Nature Journal Club Facebook page. And do you have a website yet? Yes. You do? Okay. We can yeah, find and they're you on at... your community calendar. We're actually not going to technically meet next week because it's my birthday and I was inspired by Avea to go do some kind of stewardship. So we're going to meet the week after and share our stories of the things that we went out and did. All right. Um, Rebecca, um, in honor of your birthday, I am going to go out and do a stewardship project this Wednesday. Yay. <laughs> um, so that's something that, yeah, Avea got us started um, doing um, in sort of honor of, of each other. Um, and uh, I will try to get out, I'll see if I can get out um, on bicycles with thing one and thing two after school. Oh, thanks, Brian, for sharing that. Um, oh, Amy's birth is the same birthday as me. That's cool. Uh, Amy, hey, happy birthday. Um, so yeah, that, that being able to hear those stories of what it was like before, I mean, that is, that is you know, this firsthand ecological knowledge. And- Oh, I, sorry, I, yes. I, I forgot something I wanted to add. So as an example of this, I did forest research on Long Island um, in New York, and we got to meet with the Shinnecock Nation, which is the indigenous community that lives there, and it's a fire dependent ecosystem there, so they need to do controlled burns and stuff, but it's really hard to know what was the fire regime like a long time ago, like how often were there fires, and how intense were they, and all these things, it's really hard for them to figure out what they need to do, um, but there were some Shinnecock elders who were able to, like they like there were no fires in some of these areas for over 50 years like it was really neglected and they were able the elders remembered though like they were able to share you know how they did the controlled burns like over 50 years ago wow. so that's just one example of how like I mean like taking care of an ecosystem like there's certain knowledge that um might have been forgotten if they didn't talk to the elders about it. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I know that <clears throat> I remember my dad saying, you know, when I was a boy, and now I'm doing the with my daughters when I was a boy. Um, but you're right that things that move slowly. Um, we we, we lose track that, you know, just say when, when, with the, like the general abundance of birds, the number of birds that are alive in North America right now is one third less than it was when I was born. So we take all those little birds, remove a third of them. And my daughter's looking around like this is the, so when I was a kid, there were actually more birds for me to look at. And now when I try to show birds to my daughters, there's one third less birds flapping around for me to be able to, to, to show them. You're right, that, that's, that's a great um, uh, example of um, the, the, the wisdom that is in the heads of our elders that to be wise, we need to eagerly engage with. Yvea. I am loving this. And just hearing about 
this idea of talking to the elders about their story, it makes me, well, first of all, I really wish my Nana were still here so that I could ask her so many more questions. As I grew older, I began to realize the value of that. And I tried to ask as many as I could. Sometimes it's hard to know where to start a conversation. So having more of those and showing more of those conversations in a community will help you know how to ask. And I just thought, wouldn't it be so cool if we listened to the stories of our elders and then sketch noted them, and then they could see that we listened so much that we've put them down to be remembered for always like that. Um, just finding different ways of showing that we're listening. Um, and yeah, it, it's, 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 it's sad that we, at least a lot of culture here in the United States is just to, to put them, to put our elders somewhere else. And a lot of times very much against their will, those who don't wanna go to retirement homes or wherever. I remember my Nana vehemently not wanting to go. And so she fought that until the very end and didn't go in the end, which was a good thing. Cause her, cause I think that would have made her more depressed. Um, and so one of the things that I'd written into the chat um, was that um, I think that another thing too is here, it's kind of to go off of what Aisha was saying earlier about, about you know, the, how we treat elders here in the United States. And that's that here, if you live with your elders, even to support them, a lot of people will judge you. They'll say that you're not grown up enough to, um, because you're not living on your own. And there's this huge expectation you should go be by yourself and not living with your elders. And I can speak from experience because I live with my 76 year old godmother. People have come up to me and, and she, mind you, she wants me to stay with her. But people have said, don't you think it's time you stop imposing on Kay? You know, she must not really want you and your son around taking up that much space in your house. I mean, your stuff is everywhere. And plus, don't you think it'd be nice to give her some space? And she gets so mad when she hears people are saying that. She's like, who says that to you? I don't ever want you to leave. And it's again, that thing about some people, it, we're all different people. Some people will want to be alone and have their independence and have their space like my Nana. Others like my godmother will want people to stick with them. And it's important that you ask and then listen to the answer for that. And so then when it comes to the nature journaling, I think that it's important to ask and then really listen to where somebody's at and listen to their own individual um, pace. Um, I think that was what I was gonna say. You're, you're asking and you're also actively listening. Um, I'm going to bounce over to Rebecca, um, who's been dropping some thoughts in about loneliness um, that I think are really germane here. And then we're gonna jump over to um, Aisha, uh, um, um, to, to Aisha. Yeah, well, it took I, me a while. <laughs> um, yeah, I always think it's really sad that in our culture, elders just live on their own or in nursing homes and stuff and that we don't live very often like as multi-generational because I've read that loneliness is actually more deadly than smoking for you it's like it's actually technically really bad for your health and that's that's not good when like people have lived their whole lives and now they just have to be all alone I just think that's really sad and like even for me personally like like Ivea was saying, there's this idea if you don't live on your own, like all by yourself, then yeah, it's like you're not grown up enough, like you have to be independent. Um, but like, I want to live with my family and my family wants me to live here too. So I think it's, it's interesting that like not all of us want what the kind of dominant culture expects us to and that it's not necessarily the best thing for us socially or even for our health. Yeah. I'll see if I can find that, that source where it says it's more dangerous than smoking. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really powerful. Um, and, you know, we're, we're in the process of sort of re-envisioning what we want this nature journaling community to deliberately look like. And how can we be um, uh, I, I think that something that we're that I'm I'm, I'm seeing as, as as a thread here uh, from from lots of comments and lots of things that I'm thinking that this this if we are proactive about thinking about the, the role and ability of elders to engage in this community, um, we are really making 
this, um, our, our, our world just got better. Um, Aisha, and then um, Chris, if you feel comfortable, I'd love to bring you on um, to share some of the, the thoughts and ideas that, that, that you've had. Uh, yeah, I think I was just going to um, say that what's really coming out of this for me and from hearing all of you and your sort of excitement about working intergenerationally is that as nature educators, we can be the models in a group showing that respect for their knowledge and that shifting baseline and everything we've talked about. And um, while we're taking care of the Maslow pyramid needs, but really maybe this is gonna be a really strong point because we've all thought it through. And that others who perhaps don't feel that way about their elders or yeah, that's annoying mom and dad, I have to bring along on this workshop because they're in town. We can help give a different angle on how to see elders. And I just feel like that could be a really powerful thing that comes out for us as educators. Yeah. What this is, it's a, it's a beautiful opportunity for us to, in this intentional community that we're informing here, uh, that we're, that we're forming here, to um, be really deliberate about what is our relationship to the, um, Uh, what is, is, I'm sorry, I, I lost my train of thought because um, it's, it's hard with the Zoom environment. You, you, there'll be a chat thing that pops up and, and uh, Brian Higginbotham just blew my mind. Um, so um, after Chris, um, we're gonna bring on Brian Higginbotham to uh, expand on, a, on an idea and a thought that he just dropped in there. Um, Chris, really good to have you with us. Thank you. Um, I have battery power today. Um, I, I really am concerned that uh, from watching elders and working a little bit with them, I had some wonderful elders in my family who were so bright, but near the end, I, I think many give up because they don't feel uh, it's worth it. They, their voice has been taken away from them, uh, partially through isolation, but par partially just because they feel that um, what they're talking about isn't of value to anybody else anymore. You know, it's a confidence thing as well. And I think anything we can do to build up their confidence that, that their viewpoint is valued, that it's needed. And I think there's a real thread here where the nature can, journaling, et cetera, and community and all can bolster that need for, um, for us to listen to the elders, you know, we can, I'm, I'm also one myself, but I really think that there are so many people out there that have something really strong to say. And uh, I, I don't know how we do it necessarily, but I like your word deliberate. Uh, I think in many ways, you know, we don't set things up so that they can be listened to. Maybe I'm not quite sure how to say that, but no, no, yeah, no, absolutely, and and also that is part of that 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 ties into the practice which we're doing with our with nature journaling, which starts with you know I notice the right. act of deliberate attention, and I think some of you have may have heard me talk about this before. Right. My kind of working definition of love is the act of sustained compassionate attention. Okay. That love yes. itself is the act of attention. And um, that's what builds, that's also the glue that creates relationship. Right. So there's and, trust, trust with, between the elders you're working with has to be really strong. And I think we can, we all know how to, to build that, but we don't necessarily uh, see ways. It's not necessarily what we were talking about before with them, uh, being afraid of losing their independence or uh, doing being able to do things on their own, but a trust in what they can do, a trust, mm -hmm. you know, honoring what they do bring. Yeah. 
that that will help with the sort of self confidence, right? That has been been stolen, drip by drip by drip. Oh yeah. Um, as you know, the, the the media decides that you know you're no longer the face we're going to show. You know, and with the pandemic, we were instantly declared, uh, you know, hazard. We, we were high risk and not uh, important. You know, we, we weren't necessary. Yeah. And that was just recently mm. hard to take. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But the, um, yeah, so these are the patterns in the sort of prevailing culture that are around us. And if we're going to kind of sail against that wind, it's going to take intentionality and there will be missteps and it's gonna take work. So too, with thinking about our, our relationship with, um, with, with, with race um, and uh, in, in, in this country, we, it, it takes work and, and it doesn't just happen that like, Oh, I think it'd be nice if we kind of all got along and then it does. Um, um, thank you so much, Chris. Those are really, really important, important thoughts. And I'm now going to, I'm, I'm in the current, current I'm, I'm sort of drawing my own little kind of megaphone in my sketch notes um, in terms of giving voice. Um, and Brian, um, could I get you to articulate um, some of those thoughts you're put, dropping into the chat? Is that me? Um, so I was just building off of what uh, Rebecca was saying, and I'm certainly not an expert in this area, but I think a lot of the writing about loneliness and you know really stems from a lack of engagement as opposed to being physically alone, though obviously that contributes. Um, and so I think, you know, for our purposes, thinking about nature journaling events as more collaborative, perhaps, where there's less emphasis on the stamina of being out nature journaling for many hours at a time, or maybe the blocks of time don't become, you know, too long. So there's less physical pain from writing. And maybe then you get, you know, more people to engage and uh, talk about everything we've talked about here, right? So you know, they can rehash how many birds there used to be in a particular area and we can get that level of engagement. It also helps with children, I think as well, who may have a limited, you know, on repeated engagements, we can build their uh, ability to focus for longer periods of time. But certainly when they are new to this practice, it's difficult to focus for a long time. So having shorter, you know, sessions, which then involve more time, uh, hearing from everyone and engaging that can help people you know it's like the journal shares where you can see what other people are doing and that helps you maybe get quicker you know more tips to think about what you're doing and so that you know thinking of these events as sort of engagement um i think is an important part of the community and it's something that you see you know if you look at the demographics of churches right they're they skew older but having that sunday gathering i think was really important for people especially pre-COVID. And so, you know, for other folks who maybe don't have that same denominational poll, you know, having the gatherings like this are an important, you know, vehicle for community engagement, I think. Yeah, so one idea that sort of uh, that you, that, that Brian just made here is to, we want to structure our activities so that somebody, um, you know, it doesn't have to be like, you want to go do nature journal journaling? You ready for the marathon? Because, you know, that, that, yeah, that it's not a stamina test that, and that to set up our activities so that you could take a little piece. Um, so, or maybe that the um, activities, if you are going to have a longer activity, it's compartmentalized and somebody could choose to do this block and not this block. Um, and to have kind of natural entry and exits for people who choose to kind of come in and come out at those points. And for people who want to sort of stay for the whole thing, you can. Um, that's, that's really, that's really useful. Um, 
Hello, my name is Diane. I'm just a caller. At some point, I'd like to share as well, but whenever it's good. Um, Diane, this is a, a, a great time. Um, Diane, welcome to our conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I just was, there's such wonderful ideas in this group and with so many different um, viewpoints. And I was just thinking there's, um, I had a just that we're talking about an age group that could be from 50 to 100. So, you know, there's just such varied um, capability levels and different kinds of engagement. Um, people here sound so in tune to that, that I'm just thinking um, maybe even um, senior centers and where, where there are even indoor activities, but that uh, the, the educators forum creates maybe um, the kits uh, to provide for instruction and um, maybe monthly kits and ideas for those that are already in their midst, either at senior centers or senior communities or facilities, um, either in um, bringing nature to those without the ability, the mobility to get to nature, and then engaging in the artistic activity and writing activities. Um, I'm, I was also thinking that, you know, could introduce adaptive aids for the art supplies. Um, there could be nature films so that they can actually, those that don't have mobility could experience the places that your nature journaling people go. Um, maybe even video along on some trips that are shared with these people and then share the um, um, activity material in, in indoor settings, um, indoor related groups. And I'm, I was also thinking that if there were like these kits, if it was a kit, let's say this is on someone's heart to do with a loved one or an elder, uh, in their midst, um, these kits could just be, um, you know, a plethora of different ideas uh, packaged up and purchased, maybe to support whatever, and um, and then used in all of these different settings. So anyway, those are just a quick ideas, but I wanted to share it with all these my beautiful minds on here. Well, I'm really glad you you did share those those thoughts and ideas. Um, so thinking about programs that we could do, kind of going into, um, you know, for 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 people who already sort of have been walled off, um, kind of deliberately crossing over some of those 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 walls and borders to see how we can bring um, nature journaling to um, to people in um, senior communities. Uh, you also mentioned, and, and that would take some real deliberate thinking about on our end as educators about what media, um, what phenomena, um, what, you know, how, what would be the best ways to, to do that? Um, and then also, are there ways of making social links between people in those communities and centers with the rest of this uh, nature journaling community here. Um, you're also talking about creating videos to do those sorts of things. Actually, um, I'm in discussion with um, David Lucas, who is a wonderful naturalist, um, about making, um, uh, we're gonna try to use, uh, try to get him to use the Billy Joe um, technique of, of, of having that little uh, thing where you can do the Zoom meeting from the remote place out in the forest. Remember you telling us about that, Billy Joe? Um, he lives up in northern Washington in a crazy area of, of wilderness. Um, and to, to start to make regular online events where people with mobility problems would be able to kind of go on nature expeditions with with, with him to do nature journaling. So that will be coming um, soon, we hope. Um, we're gonna try to get that Billy Joe technique um, down. So if we have trouble with that Billy Joe, we're gonna be calling it. Um, we're shortly going to be um, calling this discussion to a close. I'm really delighted with how 
uh, rich this has been. And um, but, but before we do, Rebecca, you had your hand up. I want to just return to you and give you uh, an opportunity to share Hi, whatever's again. on your mind. So uh, there were just a, I put a couple things in the chat. Um, I was thinking about in some cultures, like all the elders are called like grandma or grandpa. And sometimes people are like, wait, how many grandmas do you have? <laughs> um, and it's just that there, are, not only can we learn from the elders, but it's more people that kids and young people can have a chance to go to if they, you know, whatever happened today. So when we do nature journals, like, you know, we are going out and learning things and then coming back and sharing our nature journals with each other. And I feel like that's very similar to traditional cultures. You know, people will go out and do things and learn what's going around them. And especially kids, then they come back and share it. And like, that's how you learn. And, you know, in, in our culture, if with like nuclear families, kids only have their parents to talk to. Um, it's, I think, probably hard for kids to not have other adults that they can just go to and talk and share the cool things that they found that day or whatever it is. Um, so I think that's another benefit of having that the intergenerational connections. Um, and uh, just one other thing I want to share, I, I think I'll talk more about this if I do an intergenerational um, nature journal, nature story workshop um, for the writing workshop. But um, this is a project that I did for my honors project in college. It's a storybook based on research about um, indicator species in an agroforestry system in a Mayan community in Mexico. And they didn't, the, this, this book came about because of interviews with elders that were part of the, the more scientific research project um, to learn about the, the, there are certain species that indicate if the weather is going to change and what time they should plant the crops and all of these things. But the question is, will they still be reliable with climate change? Will they still indicate the same things? Um, and so there were interviews um, that the uh, researcher who was my mentor asked the elders you know, about the different indicators and completely unprompted, they all said that they were concerned that the younger people weren't learning this knowledge anymore. They weren't as interested in it and they, they weren't having as much of a chance to, to learn about it. So as a way to kind of give back to the community there, they came up um, and I, I ended up doing, taking on the project to make a picture book for the kids about this knowledge. And so the, it's um, basically this, this kid is the main character and he goes, basically the book is that the, the grandma goes around and teaches him about all the different species that are important to them. And then, wow. Um, and what's really cool is that the, the final version has three languages. It's English, Spanish, and Lac and Mayan. <laughs> and, oh, that's so cool. Um, but, what, but what only just occurred to me, right, like a couple minutes ago, and I, I worked on this project like, for like a year, a couple of years ago, but what only just occurred to me is like, maybe it's not even his biological grandma. Maybe it's just like one of the elders that he calls grandma because mm -hmm. they would have all been connected in that way. So that's when we have traditional ecological knowledge that can be really important for conservation. And, and being able to understand how the species are changing and our relationships with those species as a culture. Mm. Oh, that's, that's really valuable. Um, what, a, what a wonderful project. That's, um, you know, this, is, this is something you've been thinking about for a long time. Yeah. Um, so 
this isn't the end of this conversation. Oh, and uh, Rebecca, I'll get you in touch with David Lucas. I think he'd love to talk with you. We um, have talked, we've talked actually. Oh, okay, great. Um, so I, I, I bought his book. Um, I've, I've read it. I actually need to get back in touch with him. So if we, if we, if we can set up a specific date. Great. Yeah, he wrote a book uh, called Language Making Nature. That's all about how are the words that we use um, like uh, make us think about nature and like how we can make up new words to describe things in nature. And he goes very in detail about like all the different um, ways that the language is formed and like how we might go about creating new words, um, which is really, really cool. And I think it would be really fun to have a workshop about that. I, I think you, he, he would be a great guest. I've, I've worked with him a lot in the field and um, really wonderful educator. Um, but just sort of to, to circle back um, to our, our topic of the day, um, thinking about um, it, I think it started as a, a conversation about how can we, uh, what do we want to do to, 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 to make our, our, our programs more accessible for, for elders. And it evolves into, a, I think, a deeper discussion of the importance of doing that for our society and for this nature journaling community. Let's keep this uh, these thoughts and ideas active for us as, as educators. Let's think about what we can do um, individually to make this happen. And also think about, um, you know, as we are, as we emerge from COVID and we are creating this new intentional community of nature journaling, uh, what can we do to, to be intentional about um, not just uh, uh, inclusivity of elders, but honoring and celebrating uh, what they bring to, to us and our, our world. Thank you all for your participations, participations? For your participation, um, thoughts and ideas. And um, I'm, I'm so grateful to you for bringing this level of deep thought and, and wisdom to, to the table. I'm really honored to be in this community of educators with you.